I am John, a 52-year-old man, happily married to his wife Serena, who is 47 years old, but she looks much younger than her years. Serena is an amazing woman with tall stature, long black hair, fair complexion, and an amazing physique. She diligently takes care of her appearance, exercising regularly, and following a healthy diet. Our path of love has been going on for 24 years now, and we are looking forward to celebrating our 25th anniversary in a month. We have two sons, Michael and Ben, who have recently entered the marital path and created their own families. We often come across both of them, as they are in close geographical proximity to us. I work for a pharmaceutical company based in New Jersey that specializes in the production of both ethical drugs and generics. As one of the largest manufacturers on the East Coast, we are under strict FDA control. It is extremely important that each drug is carefully documented and always taken into account. But a recent FDA audit revealed some inconsistencies in our documentation, which led to an increase in the frequency of inspections. This continued until he decided that our affairs were organized properly. As Vice President of Regulatory Compliance, I devoted a lot of time and went to our remote warehouse once every two months. This was necessary in order to ensure my presence during the inventory check. The amount of work was difficult, but I diligently trained three more regulatory compliance technicians, who eventually had to take on this responsibility. This difficult job began to affect my personal life, but we were on the verge of recertification. I have recently started to reduce the amount of work and think about retirement. I plan to retire after I had successfully implemented new technologies and completed or started the recertification process. Ideally, I wanted to reach this milestone by our anniversary. I kept this decision a secret from Serena because I wanted it to be a pleasant surprise. Taking advantage of a rare free moment at work, I started looking for a jeweler who could help me with a special project. The project was supposed to mark our upcoming silver anniversary. I was planning to do something unusual for Serena, so I went in search of the perfect jewelry store. Eventually I came across a quaint little shop conveniently located opposite the busy Domin Alley. A close friend, who had previously ordered a wonderful locket for his wife in this particular store, strongly recommended it to me. Inspired by his gesture, I decided that the same locket would be the perfect wedding anniversary gift for my beloved wife. When I entered the store I was greeted by its owner, a Pakistani gentleman who moved to this country more than 15 years ago. It was obvious that he had mastered English, as our conversation proceeded effortlessly. I shared my vision with him, describing in detail the specific design I had in mind for the gift. I was once the owner of an amazing diamond ring weighing at least one carat and an immaculately pure white stone. But since I no longer wore it, I decided to turn it into a necklace for my beloved wife, who has always admired this diamond. The expert jeweler admired the stone and offered me a choice of many exquisite frames made of white gold and sterling silver. Among the suggested options, I chose a wonderful design in which three small diamonds surrounded an outstanding central stone. Its splendor was undeniable. Having agreed on an acceptable price, I entrusted the ring to a jeweler, confident in his professionalism and looking forward to the transformation. He took a picture through a telescopic sight and provided me with a duplicate for safekeeping. The duplicate will be ready in about two weeks, which was the ideal option. Returning to the busy main street, I glanced to my right and noticed Serena coming out of the hotel lobby. Fearing her questions about my activities, I quickly disappeared into a nearby alley and watched her hail a taxi. Her presence took me by surprise, as I was not aware of any planned visits to the city center, nor of any plans related to the hotel on her part. Watching this scene my gaze settled on Bill as he left the hotel and approached her. Involved in the conversation, she couldn't help but laugh at what he said. A moment later she gracefully got into a taxi and drove away, leaving Bill to continue on his way. It was not a simple acquaintance, but my dear friend Bill. 
Our relationship was formed when I first started working at the company, and he was our reliable assistant. Over the years our friendship has deepened, and Bill and his wife Sally have become regular guests in our modest apartment. Over the decade of our relationship, we had countless experiences, including several unforgettable trips together, until the pressure of my demanding job disrupted our adventures. As the taxi drove away, I thought about the events that had just happened. Perhaps, I reflected, my wife has planned something special for our anniversary, and Bill is helping her make this event unforgettable. Although I couldn't figure out what they might be up to at the hotel, I decided to patiently observe the situation and let it develop naturally. In the evening, I would raise a few questions in the comfort of our spacious two-story colonial house located in the elite area where we lived. Over the years, my successful career has earned me a decent salary, allowing us to enjoy all the delights of life. In addition to the fact that I received a significant inheritance from my parents, I diligently followed the instructions of my investment advisor, as a result of which the funds increased significantly and almost doubled the initial cost. Serena and I made a joint decision to refrain from using this money until my retirement, and it seemed that the right moment had finally arrived. Our two children have successfully completed their college studies and started their own path, as a result of which our current housing has become too spacious for the two of us. But our attachment to the house remained strong, and we decided to continue living in it. Returning to this cherished home in the presence of my beloved Serena brought me great joy and satisfaction. She was always ready with a drink in hand, looking forward to me, and our daily routine was to discuss our days. But tonight, I had a feeling that things might take an interesting turn. After leaving the garage, I went into the kitchen and put my briefcase on the floor. Quickly taking off my jacket and tie, I carefully hung them on the nearest hanger in the hallway and headed to the room that we affectionately called the library, despite its meager book collection. As expected, Serena was there, patiently waiting for my arrival. After exchanging warm greetings, she asked about the events of my day. I expressed satisfaction with the productivity of the day, stressing that I had managed to complete several planned tasks and successfully complete all the necessary preparations for the upcoming trip to the warehouse. In contrast, she mentioned that she spent the whole day at home doing cleaning and housework. Her statement that she had spent the whole day at home aroused my suspicion, especially since it was already closer to lunch and she was in the city center. Knowing that she is not good at deception, I decided to look into this issue and observe her reaction. I asked if she had met Bill recently, as I urgently needed to discuss with him a question he had asked me about certain substances. Initially I thought he would pay a visit, but she informed me that she hadn't seen him since our visit to their house about a week ago. It became obvious that the lies were beginning to accumulate. As I continued down this path, I realized that she would eventually let it slip if I pressed her further. Therefore, I decided to refrain from further inquiries. My anxiety grew exponentially as suspicions of an alarming situation arose. Recently I have repeatedly made attempts to initiate intimacy, but I have come across her restrained refusals, accompanied by various excuses, hinting at her lack of desire to engage in an intimate relationship. The last incident occurred on Sunday evening, when she explained the reason for a sudden headache before going to bed. For fear of provoking her anger, I refrained from discussing the matter with her. But now I couldn't help but think about the possibility of a hidden reason. Based on this, I suggested having dinner with our friends Bill and Sally on Friday night, hoping that this would give us an opportunity to rebuild our relationship. Unfortunately, she expressed her disinterest in dinners this week. Perhaps we could schedule it for the next week. But I expressed my reluctance to make any plans during the trip, as I prefer that this time remain free. Instead, I suggested doing it this week, explaining my plans for the upcoming trip. I was curious, as I noticed that she felt anxious whenever I mentioned Bill's name, which prompted me to ask if there were any disagreements between them that I was unaware of. This seemed to cause her even more discomfort, and she abruptly left the room, saying that she needed to go to the toilet. 
Watching her reactions and responses, it became quite clear to me that she was feeling guilty, and it seemed that Bill was somehow involved in this. Realizing this, I made a conscious decision not to push her further when she returned to the room. When she sat down in her seat, I cautiously asked her what she thought about our upcoming anniversary next month. I suggested the idea of having a party at our house, surrounded by our closest friends, Bill, Sally, Justin, Philistine, and even suggested inviting the children and their partners. To relieve stress, I mentioned the possibility of catering. She mentioned that she hadn't thought about it yet, so she wasn't sure, and asked if I wanted it. In response, I said that I thought it might be a positive and pleasant idea, since we both haven't had enough fun lately. I confessed that I did not understand the reason for this lack of pleasure, and asked if she knew what the reason was. Curious, she asked me to clarify what I mean by the word fun, and how it affected my busy work schedule and frequent trips. Afterwards, I touched on the topic of our personal life, and admitted that I was not too exhausted for this. But she hasn't shown any interest in me for the last six months, and I can't help but wonder what the reason is. When I asked her about it, she said she wasn't feeling well, which I already knew, but clarified that she was actually the one who had distanced herself from me. This revelation angered her, but not because of my accusations, but because I was right, and she did not want to reveal the reasons for her change in behavior. By this point, I had already guessed what was really going on. Apologizing, I told her that I would give her freedom and respect her decision. It turned out that she had her own good reasons albeit undisclosed ones. Although I'm not sure about the specifics, I'll take it upon myself to plan the anniversary dinner next month, letting my partner relax and trust me with the details. I expressed regret for my inappropriate comment about our intimate life and assured her that I would wait patiently until she felt comfortable discussing it. Having said that, I left the room and retired to my office, turning on the TV. Unfortunately, none of the available programs interested me, but I used this time to think about the upcoming trip, realizing that it is a decisive factor in determining my future actions. While I was at home, he and Bill were overly vigilant, aware of my growing suspicions. Although she didn't know about my awareness, she couldn't completely reject such a possibility. The next day, Thursday, I went to work and decided to contact my trusted friend in the electronics industry. Our past cooperation contributed to the establishment of a strong, trusting relationship, which made him an ideal confidant. I told him about my requirements, and he in turn advised me what is better to buy. I contacted the recommended store and placed the order as suggested. Later that day, the goods were promptly delivered to my office. Having well-connected friends is definitely beneficial. My goal was simple. I needed 10 inconspicuous and inconspicuous voice-activated bugs that could be easily hidden. In addition, I had two receivers, one single-channel, battery-powered, capable of transmitting signals up to a mile away, and the second with a range of just under 300 feet. I strategically placed bugs throughout the house, assigning one bug to each room for comprehensive surveillance. In addition, I discreetly placed one bug in her purse and hid the corresponding receiver in her car. Thus, any conversation she has while driving or with her purse will be picked up by a bug, and the receiver in the trunk of the car will record up to five hours of audio from a distance of up to a kilometer. I installed a bug during her absence when she went to the store and set up a voice recorder in the basement workshop. I turned on the radio in the spare bedroom and then went down to the workshop, wanting to listen. It was a stroke of luck. I assumed that I would have to wait until she left for the night to plant a bug in her car, discreetly hiding it in her purse. But luck smiled on me when she dozed off prematurely on the couch in the living room. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I quickly attached the bug to her purse with glue, wasting no time. Then I took out my dictaphone and went to her car. Carefully putting it in the trunk, I did another check, relieved to find that everything was working flawlessly. Everything was ready, and I was completely ready. Friday dragged by slowly, 
as if time itself was moving at the speed of a sluggish snail. Anticipation grew in me. I wanted to reveal the secrets hidden in the walls of my own house. But I knew I had to be patient and wait until dinner to satisfy my curiosity. The feeling of contradiction did not leave me. I was torn between two opposing desires. Part of me longed for the tape to be empty, preserving the familiarity of my world. A world that can be mundane and uninteresting, but reliable, with a faithful wife and a strong marriage. And yet, deep down, I couldn't shake the expectation that reality might be different. When I found out about her infidelity, it triggered a cascade of thoughts in me. I couldn't help but think about the reasons that led her to cheat on me. What led to the fact that our once vibrant love life has reached a dead end? Why did she choose to hide her problems instead of coming to me in an attempt to save our relationship? For 25 years of marriage, I believed that we had an incredible bond filled with love and happiness. What has changed our dynamics so dramatically? Perhaps deep down, nothing has changed. Unknowingly, I didn't pay attention to her recent actions. I've been thinking tirelessly all afternoon, but I haven't found any solutions. As evening approached, our usual conversation at dinner stopped, leaving a void in its wake. The exchange of opinions that we usually had, asking each other about how the day had gone, went unnoticed. Her behavior became more and more temperamental, as if she had mentally moved into another sphere. My anxiety grew as I anxiously anticipated what awaited me later. The rest of the evening passed unnoticed, leaving nothing but obligatory communication. In the end, she announced her imminent retirement and went up the stairs leading to our shared bedroom. After waiting for about an hour, I went up the stairs to check on her. The rhythmic sound of her breathing convinced me that she was fast asleep. When I went back down, my gaze fell on a dictaphone on which something interesting was recorded. With a light movement, I rewound it and pressed the play button. At first, the unmistakable ringing of the phone rang in my ears, confirming that the recorder was working flawlessly. The siren's voice broke the silence as she answered the call. From that moment on, I only heard part of her conversation. As the conversation progressed, I sensed a hidden meaning. It unfolded as follows. Hello? What is the reason for your call at this moment? What do you want? No, you know what? I'm not going to date you today or tomorrow. I will refrain from any action until he leaves the city. Yes, let's stick to the same time and place. Bye. After that, the only call was from one of our children, which she answered later that morning. There were no more calls after lunch, and she stayed at home without leaving it. I specifically avoided checking the car radio or anything else. Throughout the weekend, I made a conscious effort to stay away from her. The anger I felt deep inside me was so intense that I knew I had to keep my distance. Despite the pain I had caused, I felt in my gut that their paths would cross again. In order to convince myself and possibly my lawyer, I needed to gather more evidence to confirm what I already knew. Although I had enough information to be sure of their actions, I understood how important it was to get additional evidence. I patiently waited for the right moment to reveal my secret to her and devised a plan that would make our upcoming anniversary truly exceptional. When Wednesday morning came, I took the opportunity to inform her that I had postponed the trip, assuring her that it would be a short tour and I would be back for dinner. I shared with her my intention to focus on preparing for the party and promised to come back later. Noticing her radiant smile, she expressed her excitement about the upcoming holiday. After an hour of waiting, she decided to pick up the phone and call Bill. I didn't pay attention to it because the conversation was being recorded. I was sure they were arranging for another time. The day went incredibly well, and I found myself in a great mood, even started singing. It was a rare feeling of pure joy that took me by surprise. However, this realization also made me think about why I am so calm about the possible end of my marriage. That thought alone quickly darkened my mood, and the pain surged back into me with renewed force. Considering my next steps, I went down to the basement. Q 
curious, I decided to rewind the tape of that day and eagerly pressed the play button. From the speakers came the voice of Serena, who was talking to her lover Bill. Her words sounded something like this. Hello, he just informed me that his schedule for next Wednesday will undergo changes. He will leave later and return home earlier. However, we can still meet for lunch, but I have to make sure I get back to Casey sooner than I planned. I do not know why he changed his plans. Apart from arranging some things related to the anniversary celebration, he doesn't seem to know about other important matters. If he knew something, he would certainly have told me, and would not have kept it to himself. Although I am not sure of myself, I sincerely talked about the need to end our relationship. Perhaps he doesn't need to travel so often anymore. We should discuss this later. The rest of our conversation contained nothing significant, which prompted me to erase the recording and return it to its original state. Thus, Serena's intention to end the relationship came too late. When I returned upstairs, a familiar pain arose inside me again. Despite the discomfort, I decided not to stop and keep listening. For the next two weeks, I remained firm in my plan. As planned, he and Bill set up a meeting for next Wednesday. When I arrived home, I was filled with anticipation, and I quickly headed to her car while she was busy setting the dining table. I took the recorder out of the trunk and went down to the back of the house. After examining the meter, I found that two hours of film had already been consumed, and this reinforced my confidence that what awaits me will undoubtedly be exciting. The desire to immerse myself in the recording grew enormously, and I was looking forward to the moment when I could finally enjoy its contents. After dinner, I informed her that I had some business downstairs, and estimated that it would take me about an hour. She just nodded, because she knew that I rarely stayed there for long. At this time, she settled down to her usual evening knitting. When I turned on the recording, I was greeted by an hour of their playful communication, when she was doing things that I personally considered unremarkable, but which obviously brought him joy. It turned out that Bill lacked neither creativity nor intelligence. As I listened, the monotony of the sounds became more and more commonplace. The room was filled only with grunts, moans, and the incessant creaking of the bed. With each passing moment, my heart sank lower and lower, burdened with the burden of watching my marriage slowly crumble. The recording went on for what seemed like an eternity, stretching for almost 30 minutes without a break. I tried to understand how much satisfaction she found in such a situation, and I couldn't understand how they could expect forgiveness for this betrayal. The closeness we shared surpassed the mundane events of that day. There were times when her tone showed disinterest in Bill's presence. I quickly stopped recording and rewound the tape, taking precautions. After securing it, I duplicated it, keeping one in my secure vault downstairs and the other in my secure briefcase. I intended to extract notable fragments from these phone conversations and meetings, creating an illustrative record for future use. Back upstairs, I tried to resume my evening activities as if nothing had happened. Being in her presence was a constant torment for me. I tried several times to glance in her direction, but outwardly she looked completely indifferent. It seemed that she was so used to betraying me that the very fact of being together no longer aroused any emotions in her. But just three days before the party, an unexpected incident occurred that left me perplexed. That evening, while I was listening to my usual tapes, I was interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. Bill appeared in the house, but I caught only snatches of their conversation, since Serena deliberately kept him at the entrance. She was shouting furiously at him, constantly repeating the same words. No, not here, not under my roof, never. The exchange of opinions continued for several more minutes, until the sound of a door slamming was heard in the house, followed by Serena's furious footsteps and a barrage of curses. Bill's demands seemed to be getting tougher, and Serena categorically disagreed. In the midst of these tumultuous weeks, I took matters into my own hands and turned to a lawyer to prepare the divorce papers. During all this time, I remained silent, refraining from further communication with her. I was silent only when necessary and tried to minimize any one-on-one -on -one communication with her. 
Eventually she caught my hesitation and brought up the subject a week before the party. She admitted that I hadn't talked to her much lately, and asked if there was anything bothering me, or if she had done something that upset me. Not knowing what to say, I asked if she thought she had done something to make me angry. She categorically denied it, and asked why I thought that at all. In response I told her, I already mentioned that we had certain problems but you refused to solve them. Instead, you were angry and expressed your frustration by shouting. It seems that screaming has become your default reaction to everything. I sincerely hope that you haven't done anything stupid to try to take revenge or harm me. Her lips parted in an attempt to answer, but the words wouldn't come. Eventually, she burst into tears. Trying to comfort her, I apologized if my outburst had caused her distress. I assured her that I had just thrown out my emotions and believed that she would never resort to such actions. I expressed my boundless love to her and assured her that I would never hurt her, hoping that she would really understand and believe me. But she just wiped her watery eyes and looked at me with a hint of sadness. She preferred not to answer anything, maintaining a heavy silence. In the end, she retired to the kitchen, and the topic remained untouched. Our conversations became sparse, and tension lurked between us. As for the anniversary celebration, it was scheduled for Friday evening, the day preceding our present anniversary. Friday turned out to be the perfect day for both our friends and our children. The party was thoughtfully organized, which allowed us to focus exclusively on preparing for the holiday. When the appointed hour arrived, we gathered in our bedroom, where I decided to end my avoidance and confess my feelings. In anticipation, I plucked up the courage and asked about her evening attire. In particular, I was wondering if she would be wearing the gorgeous blue dress that I had lovingly purchased for her last year. This outfit emphasized her attractiveness from all sides, showing off her captivating charms both in front and behind. Undoubtedly, I adored seeing her in this exquisite dress. When she noticed it in the shop window and expressed her admiration, I decided to buy it as a surprise. The next day I handed it to her, and her enthusiasm was palpable. She said she was going to buy it herself, and confessed her sincere affection for the item. Although in my opinion, she looked as beautiful in it as ever, she seemed doubtful. But despite that, since it was our anniversary, she thought it was a suitable gift. She asked me what outfit I would wear to the celebration. I assured her that I would be wearing a shirt, tie, and jacket, as I did not want to distract attention from her. She blushed with pleasure, and after a while a smile appeared on her face. I really wanted her to experience joy and happiness during the anniversary celebration. I wanted this special event to be etched in our memory for many years to come. When the clock approached 7 o'clock, the appointed time for the arrival of the first guests, we were immaculately dressed and fully ready by 6.45. My gaze stopped on her as she stood in front of me in an elegant blue dress, and emotions overwhelmed me. Tears welled up in my eyes when I saw her, because she was the love of my life throughout my adult life. My whole existence revolved around her, and the thought of losing her was unbearable. Misery gripped me, forcing me to sit up and stretch until my legs gave way. I longed to give her my gift at this very moment, knowing that the more delightful memories she would have from today, the happier she would be. With determination in my voice, I expressed my wish that she would receive her gift before we joined our guests downstairs, so that she would have it just in time for the holiday. I took the gold box given to me by the jeweler and went to the chest of drawers. I quickly took the necklace and stood behind her, carefully fastening it around her graceful neck. She instinctively turned to the mirror, wanting to look at herself, adorned with this exquisite decoration. A radiant smile spread across her face as she declared his absolute beauty, expressing her sincere gratitude to me. With sincere love, she confessed her love for the necklace, vowing to cherish it forever. Overwhelmed with sincere gratitude, she turned to me, her eyes filled with gratitude, and gently bent down to kiss me in gratitude. In that fleeting moment, we exchanged intimate words, basking in the warmth of our affection. 
As we walked down the stairs together, my thoughts were preoccupied with the words I had said to her earlier. The undeniable truth rang in my mind like a mournful melody. I loved her deeply and unconditionally. This truth carried a tinge of sadness, because I knew that our paths were not destined to intertwine into one. Over the past few weeks, one particular situation has arisen that has caused me great difficulties. She is connected to a man who was very dear to me, but despite my love, I could not forgive her for her betrayal. What hurt me the most was that she didn't trust me and didn't try to save our marriage. She disregarded our marriage vows and turned away from our relationship and from me, seeking solace in the arms of another man. It is unpleasant to think that she sought solace in the arms of someone whom I highly valued, trusted, and respected. The scale of this betrayal, committed by two people I trusted implicitly, makes me gasp every time it comes to my mind. Lost in thought, I decided to listen to the recording of their evening together again, which eventually gave me the determination to proceed with the planned actions. All the necessary preparations seemed to be in order, the caterer prepared and ready. The intended guest list included eight people, including our two children, Bill and his wife, as well as another couple with whom we often spent time. By the will of fate, Bill and Sally were the first. I greeted Bill with a firm handshake, and Sally came up to Serena and hugged her warmly. These two were some of our oldest friends. Tonight should be a significant event, a time of rejoicing and joy. But I'm not inclined to celebrate myself, so I have no other choice. Bill congratulated me, saying that I lead an enviable existence. An amazing house, wonderful children, and a charming wife. What more could you want? Grateful for his kind words, I expressed my appreciation and acknowledged that Serena and I had indeed experienced deep happiness over 25 years of living together. But appearances can be deceiving, and Bill, being privy to certain knowledge, understood the deep meaning of my words. I turned to Sally holding out my arms in anticipation of a warm embrace. Over the years, her appearance has changed. Once a stunning beauty, now she has turned into an ordinary overweight housewife. I congratulated her, wishing her long years of happiness together. Grateful for the kind wishes, I couldn't help but admit my uncertainty about our future. In a low tone intended only for her ears, I told her about my doubts. Her expression changed to surprise when she looked up at me. I just shook my head in response, letting her know that this was not the right moment. She took Bill by the hand and led him to the bar to have a drink. After watching them leave, I turned my gaze to Serena. She stood there staring at me and asked me what I had said to cause Sally to react like that. I calmly assured her that we could discuss this later and encouraged her to just enjoy the holiday and cherish our friends and children tonight. After all, it was our 25th anniversary, and we had already lived together for 24 incredible years. As soon as the clock struck one, a booming bell rang through the house, announcing the arrival of our next guests. With great impatience, we opened the door to welcome our beloved son Michael and his wife Julie. They were followed by Justin and Phyllis, and then our second son, Ben, accompanied by his wife, Carrie. The room was instantly filled with excitement. Friends and relatives gathered around, showering us with sincere congratulations. Amid the joyful chaos, Serena and I were momentarily separated, each of us engrossed in a lively conversation with different groups of guests. People were eager to share their thoughts and admiration about our party, our beautiful house, and of course, our significant anniversary. The evening progressed rapidly, and before we knew it, it was time for the long-awaited dinner. When we sat down at the table to taste the delicious dishes prepared in honor of our special day, the room was filled with laughter, love, and cherished memories. It seemed that time flew by unnoticed, leaving us with a feeling of great gratitude for the wonderful company and the joyful celebration that unfolded in front of us. The event was flawlessly organized and conducted by a team of qualified specialists. But in the midst of all this perfection, the three of us encountered a slight hitch. 
I watched Bill and Serena closely throughout the evening. They seemed to be constantly revolving around each other, looking for a moment of privacy to talk. In the end, I saw Serena firmly take Bill by the elbow and lead him to a secluded corner. From a distance, I watched her talk seriously with him for about a minute. At first, a wide grin appeared on Bill's face, but gradually it faded away. He was listening intently to Serena's words and looked up for a moment, noticing that I was watching them. I glanced at him briefly and quickly looked away. I do not know what happened after that because my son Michael intercepted me to discuss our future plans. Avoiding specifics, I casually mentioned that we have not yet agreed. To distract myself, I talked with Justin, Philistine, my sons and their spouses as long as possible. Delaying the moment before dinner became inevitable. It wasn't until Bill and Serena entered the house that I finally joined the procession. My daughters-in-law stood next to me, one on each side, and our sons gathered around Serena. The atmosphere was charming. We shared a delicious dinner together. When the meal came to an end, I got up from my seat, preparing to make a sincere toast to our beloved friends and family. I chose the words for this momentous event with great care. Tapping the crystal wine glass lightly with a knife, I attracted everyone's attention. All eyes turned to me as I expressed my deep gratitude for their presence on this extraordinary day. It was an opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to each of them. I took the opportunity to raise a toast to everyone present. Then I made a special mention of my beloved wife, Serena. And when everyone turned their eyes in her direction, I quietly decided not to drink from my glass. Only Serena could have noticed my action. When dinner came to an end and the guests gathered in the family room for conversations and desserts, Bill came up to me with a worried expression on his face. He expressed his bewilderment about the cause of my disorder. Sally and Serena came up to me and asked me how I was feeling. I assured them that nothing was bothering me and asked them why they and others felt differently. What have I done to create this impression? He admitted that he was not sure of their thoughts, but noted that I seemed a little out of my mind that evening. He expressed his willingness to listen and offer help if I was really worried about something. I trusted him, admitting that I really had a case in which I could use his advice and support. If he and Sally are free tomorrow morning around 8.30, they can come to our place for breakfast. It would be great to have a conversation together because Sally's opinion is also important to me. Although it's still early, this is a matter of extreme importance, and I sincerely appreciate his help. He agreed to come, but asked for a hint, assuring that he would be able to maintain confidentiality. But I asked him not to worry, as it concerns work. And yet this is a surprise that I would like to reveal to everyone at the same time. Moreover, I haven't even informed Serena about it yet. After some persuasion, he finally gave up, admitting that he would not be able to get any more information out of me today. I patted him on the back in gratitude, and then turned my attention to Ben. Watching from the sidelines, I noticed how Bill struck up a conversation with Sally and Serena. They seemed to think that I had some undisclosed news related to my work, which seemed to reassure Serena. When the party began to fade, and the guests began to disperse, I walked around the hall, wishing everyone a good night and expressing my gratitude. Throughout the evening I felt a deep sense of anxiety, looking forward to its end. From start to finish, it was a painful reminder of a life that no longer made sense to me. The departure of each couple only reinforced this feeling. Bill and Sally left first, followed by Justine and Phyllis, and then Michael and Julie. In the end, my youngest son Ben and his wife Carrie said goodbye to them, who had a short conversation with Serena before leaving. Just before we left, Sally came up to me, giving me kind words and encouraging me to contact her if I needed to talk before the next day. If there is a problem, she is ready to offer her help. When she heard that, she hugged me, and Bill stood silently next to me. After expressing my gratitude, I told her that I would definitely contact her if I ever needed someone to talk to. Saying goodbye, I informed her that I would see them both the next day, 
to which she nodded and left. At that moment, her compassionate words caused me more suffering than any of Bill and Serena's actions. The unfortunate reality is that often the main pain falls on innocent people. I arranged with the caterers to remove all perishable food and scheduled them for cleaning the next morning. While they were finishing work, I went into the kitchen and looked for Serena, but she was nowhere to be found. After inquiring about her whereabouts, I received an answer that she wished me good night and retired to the upper floor. After waiting a few more minutes for the caterers to leave, I turned off the light. Before going up the stairs and entering our bedroom, I had a few things to do in the living room. When I entered the room, I found Serena still dressed in her outfit and sitting in one of the two armchairs that make up our recreation area. Exhausted, I sank into the remaining chair and looking at her felt an overwhelming sense of anguish. There was no anger in him, no thirst for retribution, only a sharp, suffocating pain. With great effort, I forced myself to smile and commented on the success of the evening. She smiled back, but her face betrayed her apprehension. With concern on her face, she asked permission to ask what was bothering her. I advised her to continue, assuring her that she was always entitled to do so. I stressed the importance of transparency in marital relations, saying that spouses should not keep secrets from each other. She asked why I lowered my glass while toasting her at the meeting. In response, I confessed my insecurity and asked her what she thought about it. Expressing her confusion, she noted that I had not talked about any misconduct on her part. It made her wonder if she had disappointed me or upset me. I answered uncertainly again, stating that I did not know the reason. Then I asked if she had done anything to upset me, but she refused saying that she had tried to identify possible problems, but could not specify anything specific. I apologized, but expressed my skepticism, being convinced that there are serious problems in our marriage. But feeling tired, I decided to postpone discussing these issues with her until the next day. With that, I got up and headed down the hall to the guest room, seeking solace until I lost control of my emotions. After rearranging a few things, I entered the room and closed the door behind me. In all the years that we lived in our house, I never spent the night in the guest room and did not deny my beloved wife access to our shared bed. The bitterness of my action weighed on me, was almost unbearable. After making sure that the necessary things were in my briefcase the next day, I undressed, turned off the light, and lay down on the bed knowing full well that sleep would not give me rest most of the night. I was startled by a light tapping on the door, after which Serena's voice timidly asked permission to enter. Ignoring her, I chose not to answer, and eventually she gave up and retired to our bedroom. Tears welled up in my eyes as I lay there, plunged into a restless doze inspired by disturbing nightmares. When I woke up, it was already 6.45 a.m., but I decided to soak up some more under the covers. I usually got up quickly and went downstairs to have breakfast by 7.15 a.m., but that morning the hunger disappeared, and I was left without appetite. I decided to stay in the room until I found her leaving downstairs, after which I went to the bathroom. After a while, I returned to the room and stayed there until almost 8.15, dreading the upcoming meeting with her. Reluctantly, I went downstairs, feeling sad. When I entered the kitchen, I found her sitting at the table, not moving and not meeting my gaze. Trying to feign confidence, I plucked up the courage and greeted her with a forced, good morning. Trying to diffuse the situation, I added, is there any coffee? I could use a cup. I went to the vending machine and filled a cup of coffee, which had already acquired a thick consistency. It had been brewed a few hours ago and now had a bitter taste, but I decided to drink it anyway, as it suited my mood. Without exchanging a single word, I walked to the chair opposite her, clutching a cup of bitter coffee and the morning newspaper, patiently waiting for Bill and Sally to arrive. I deliberately kept their visit a secret from her, wanting to surprise her when they showed up. As I was carefully folding the newspaper, Preparing to immerse myself in its contents, she looked up and looked directly at me, 
In a low, barely audible tone, she cautiously asked if I was suspicious of her, implying that this conversation was related to this. It became noticeable that tears were running down her cheeks, but I preferred not to go into details until her lover arrived. But if they hadn't arrived on time, I would have been forced to turn to her. Just as I was about to speak, the doorbell rang. Startled, she raised her head and hurriedly wiped away her tears and headed for the door. When she opened it, she was surprised to find Bill and Sally standing there. Her voice filled with surprise, and she said she hadn't expected them to come. Bill replied that I had invited them to visit the night before. He seemed overwhelmed by her impatience. Sally seemed to notice her distress, drawing attention to her tear-stained appearance and expressing concern for her well-being. But she reassured them that she was fine and warmly welcomed them into the house. Later, she asked me about my reasons for inviting Bill and Sally that morning, wanting to sort out the situation. In a voice full of enthusiasm, I greeted everyone warmly when they entered the room. As soon as everyone was in their seats, Bill and Sally comfortably seated next to each other on the couch, and Serena in her cherished armchair, I headed for my trusty briefcase. Extracting two Manila 8x10 envelopes from its depths, I went to them in the center of the hall, fixing my gaze on each one. Realizing that I had put a lot of thought into it at that moment, I informed him that I had several surprises for each of them. Expressing my recognition that I devoted many hours to work, as well as that my trips took a lot of time, I spoke about the importance of this event. I thought it was necessary that a lot of people relied on me, so I couldn't afford to disappoint them. But recently I hired three new employees who are able to handle this job on their own. I've always intended to retire as soon as I feel comfortable. Now that moment has come, and a week ago I officially left my post, admitting that it was time for me to rest. Serena asked why I hadn't mentioned this earlier, expressing her willingness to support my choice. My wife, as always astute, realized that my work was taking away my strength. Bill, supporting her, said that I shouldn't waste time working for a company that doesn't prioritize my well-being. He even advised me to give them the opportunity to live without me for a while. Grateful for their support, I shared my excitement about planning to take my amazing wife on a trip to celebrate our 25 anniversary. I told him that I had already booked a plane ticket to Miami, and from there we would go on a wonderful sea cruise. At first I was going to accompany her, but I hesitated for a moment. It dawned on me that if I carried out my decision, it would be impossible to reverse it. And then, having plucked up the courage, I decided to reveal my secret. It was with great trepidation that I expressed my concern that her absence would inevitably affect her meetings with Bill at the hotel on Wednesday afternoon. In an instant, all three pairs of eyes were fixed on me, and the atmosphere became tense with the weight of the truth. Now that my secret was out, I gathered all my resolve and headed for the table. I pressed the play button on the recorder that stood in front of me, ready to show the recording that I had carefully assembled. It contained fragments of conversations between Serena and Bob, designed to convey the essence of their last meeting on Wednesday. The sounds of their voices came from the speakers, filling the room. When the recording came to an end, I turned it off and looked at the trio standing in front of me. The expressions on their faces said a lot. The siren looked stunned, as if I had suddenly hit her, her complexion had lost its colors. I had never seen her look so pale before. As she sank into the chair, her hands instinctively covered her face. A small, trembling voice escaped her lips. Oh, please, God, no! Glancing at Bill, I saw that the same expression of shock was on his face. But what caught my attention even more was the fury radiating from Sally's face. Meanwhile, Serena's tears were flowing freely, and her gaze, fixed on me, was filled with a mixture of sadness and despair. In the midst of her sobs, she begged, begged for an opportunity to explain everything. Sally's face contorted with anger and rage, which caused her to rise from the couch in a sudden burst of energy. Bill, caught off guard, quickly got to his feet 
but faced Sally's impending wrath. At the same moment, she vented her disappointment by giving him a stinging slap in the face, from which he backed away. The sound of the impact echoed through the room like a thunderclap. Sally, spurred on by emotion, fixed her venomous gaze on Serena, uttering the words with an intensity that indicated her intention to destroy not one, but two lives. Watching Bill's incompetence as a lover, I realized that it was extremely important for me to intervene before Sally unleashed her anger on someone. In a firm tone, I demanded that Bill leave my room immediately, stressing that I never wanted to cross paths with him or engage in conversation again. It was very painful for me to realize that the person I considered a friend had betrayed my trust so deeply. Turning to Sally, I informed her that I had something very important to her, which she would undoubtedly be intrigued by. This turned out to be a complete collection of their phone conversations, containing explicit content in certain areas. To support her in case of divorce, I offered to help her by giving her a large 8x10 envelope. Taking the envelope, she abruptly left the house, and Bill followed her, looking completely confused and disoriented. I hoped that from now on, Sally would make his life incredibly difficult. I turned my gaze to Serena, who was motionlessly crying and watching the unfortunate situation between Bill and Sally. It should be clear to her now that she played an important role in the breakdown of Bill and Sally's marriage. I expressed my congratulations to her, emphasizing the fact that Bill and Sally were our old friends. Unfortunately, her actions led to the destruction of both their lives, and I can only hope that everything she got was really worth it. Sally, a genuinely compassionate and wonderful woman, did not deserve the pain that both Bill and herself caused her. Despite the tears, she begged for an opportunity to explain herself, talked about how absorbed I was in my own affairs and how desperately lonely she was. She defended Bill's intentions, claiming that he was just trying to support a friend. After observing their actions, it became clear to me that they had crossed the line, exceeding all reasonable limits. I admitted that such behavior should not be repeated, and they asked me for forgiveness, promising to correct themselves. Respecting their need for full self-expression, I waited patiently for them to finish their explanations. To be honest, I didn't expect anything else from them. Reflecting on the consequences of revealing their affair, I began a deep period of introspection. The agony I felt because of their betrayal lasted for several days, making me wonder how great their capabilities were and whether they had committed similar offenses with others. Besides, I was thinking about the possibility of living without them if I cut ties with them. With tears in her eyes, she pleaded, we shouldn't tell the boys about this. It was obvious that she had never behaved like this with anyone before. She stressed that her meetings with Bill were rare and lasted only a couple of months. Trusting her completely, I was forced to accept her declaration of love and devotion only to me. In addition, she admitted that in my absence, Bill was just a companion, complimenting her on her appearance and providing much-needed friendship in moments of loneliness. I expressed my understanding of her actions, but at the same time I wondered why she considered them justified. I would be willing to forgive her if she came to me with the intention of solving the problems in our marriage. I would not have given up the idea of attending a consultation or seeking professional help if she had told me about our problems. But she never did, even when I asked her directly about it. Instead, she turned to another man, offering him everything that she had previously promised exclusively to me. I cannot forgive her for this betrayal either now or in the future. I handed her the second envelope and handed her the divorce papers, explaining that I had taken care of their creation after quitting my job the previous week. I assured her that she would be taken care of properly. I expressed my wish that the divorce process would go smoothly and quickly, stressing that if she decides not to contest the divorce, she will receive a house and a generous amount of money. But I also warned her that if she decides to challenge the decision, then I will use in court all the evidence I have of her infidelity. I will fight fiercely to get everything, 
and leave her with nothing. Serena collapsed to the ground with her head bowed and tears streamed down her cheeks. She screamed in desperate pleading, her words full of remorse. John, please forgive me. I'm really sorry. Give me a chance to fix it. In response, I informed her that I was leaving on a planned anniversary trip, but with the intention of finalizing our divorce. I left my lawyer with detailed instructions on how to contact me and conduct the trial. Besides, I've made it clear that I don't intend to see or talk to Serena anymore. I promised to tell our sons how they could contact me, thereby providing a means of communication between us. In the end, I told her that I had found time to write separate letters to our sons, in which I described in detail how she betrayed me. I made it clear that if she resisted the divorce, then I would share these letters with them. But if she accepts my terms, they will never see them. Until then, I plan to inform our boys that she and I had difficulties that led to the conclusion that our marriage was over. We came to realize that we were estranged from each other, and we made a mutual decision to separate. I can only hope that during this time they will not have an unfavorable opinion of me. I looked at her, but there was no emotion left in me. All I could do was replay in my memory her words to Bill with such treachery in that hotel room. From that memory alone, I plucked up the courage to look away and leave the house. When I walked out the door of the house where we raised our family, her screams were still ringing in my ears. Clutching tickets to Miami and booking a hotel room, I had enough money to feed myself. I was determined to take advantage of this opportunity and make the most of it. It was a chance to start over from scratch, where I believed I could regain what I had lost, my innocence, and the ability to trust others. I'm tired of those who pretended to be my friend, but betrayed me when I least expected it. The weight of trying to save a crumbling marriage weighed on me, especially when my wife did not report the problems and did not admit what we were facing. It became obvious that her own desires and aspirations prevail over mine. For reasons known only to her, she avoided the company of another man. I was tired of trusting those who were dear to me. None of them showed sincerity, and none deserved my faith. I cherished my friendship with Bill, but I was easily betrayed. My love for Serena always seemed boundless until I realized otherwise. It becomes impossible to love unconditionally when another person changes the conditions. Going on a journey to begin the second chapter of my life, I left behind the remnants of the first half, which had its share of ups and downs, and eventually ended on a bitter note. But this time, I did not lose hope that everything would be different. Uncertainty shrouded my future path, but I was sure of one thing. I would undergo changes. The lessons I learned along the way have left an indelible mark on me. I became cautious, stopped blindly trusting others. Gone are the days when I believed that everything would always fall into place without much effort. Moreover, I'm tired of working just for someone else's benefit. It was time for a change. I began to prioritize my own well-being, allowing others to take responsibility for themselves. Driving away from the house for the last time, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw Serena running out of the house. She watched my car drive away, then collapsed into the driveway. Intrigued, I slowed down to watch this scene feeling a strange sense of satisfaction. Perhaps she really had sincere feelings. Perhaps she was experiencing the torments that have been haunting me since I found out about her betrayal. Taking my foot off the brake, I stepped on the gas pedal, realizing that my future was just around the corner. The divorce process came to an end, and it was stormy. Serena refused to get a peaceful divorce, and so I had to make public her love affair with my friend. Everyone found out how low she had sunk, her elderly parents were shocked by her act, and the children refused to communicate with her at all. A few days after everyone found out about Serena's infidelity, she had a stroke. As a result, she spent a long time in the hospital. Now Serena is not in the best condition, as she has paralyzed the entire left side of her body. There is no one to take care of her, and she will spend the remaining years of her life in a disabled home. Sally and Bill have never been able to find a common language, 
and I still talk to her periodically and try to visit her sometimes. My wife Allison and I have been happily married for four years. We are 20 years old, and we really value our married life. We both have full-time jobs and amazing plans for the future. I'm working hard, hoping to get the position of vice president. Meanwhile, Allison, a skilled seamstress at a local factory, is saving her salary to make the down payment on our dream home. In about six months, we expect that we will finally be able to purchase our own house. As soon as I get a promotion, we will be able to comfortably lead a lifestyle, we will live on my salary, which will allow Allison to fulfill her cherished desire to start a family and become a full-time mother. She loves children very much and dreams of becoming a mother. Although she understands the importance of financial stability, it is clear that this is not her main concern. The day started on a Friday in early April, and I woke up early to go to work. Today is of great importance, as it will be a decisive moment in the struggle for promotion. I have to introduce a new product that our team has been working hard on. Three competing teams participate in the presentation, and it is assumed that the winner will receive the coveted position of vice president. As a result, after much effort, our performance was scheduled for 10 a.m. When I came out of the bathroom, I saw that Allison had already got up and wished me good luck at the performance. She also reminded me to come home early, as she wants to invite me somewhere to celebrate and discuss something important. I expected to feel exhausted after the presentation, and therefore it was not easy for me to leave early. However, Allison was sympathetic to the fact that I have to get up early in the morning, go to bed late, and experience the general stress that accompanies a busy life. I am immensely grateful to her and look forward to a pleasant evening. The performance was successful, and both respected members of the board of directors praised me, hinting that victory was already in our hands. Arriving home at about 5.30, I was in high spirits, and going up the stairs, I noticed that my wife was beautifully dressed and ready to go out. As soon as I looked at her, a joyful whistle burst from my lips, to which she replied with an irresistible smile, let's go to that new French restaurant. Knowing how tirelessly I worked to secure our future, she thought I deserved something exceptional. Personally, I usually preferred a simple burger and French fries, but Allison craved an unusual evening, and I was more than willing to provide it. It was quite clear that there was a touch of romance in her plans, and I was looking forward to it. After leaving to freshen up and change clothes, I faintly caught Allison's voice in the conversation, but decided to leave everything as it is. The restaurant is located just off Castle Street and boasts ample parking. Despite its small size, the establishment is famous for its delicious cuisine. About a month ago, I had the pleasure of dining here at a business meeting, looking forward to a cozy and intimate evening. Upon arrival, there were only two other couples in the room, and we were quickly shown to a secluded corner at the back of the hall. Carried away by the conversation about our presentation and its success, we studied the menu and made a choice in favor of appetizers and main dishes. When our attentive waiter left, my attention was attracted by an unfamiliar couple who boldly entered the hall and quickly took a seat without waiting for the waiter's help. When I saw him, I had a feeling as if I had seen him somewhere before. He looks about 40 years old, he is well built and gives the impression of a wealthy man. On the other hand, she looks to be in her 20s, maybe 21 at the most, and she doesn't seem to fit in with her surroundings. She is not old enough to be his daughter, and at the same time too young to be his companion. Picking up an impressive bag, she takes out a tablet and several other items, and then approaches a couple nearby. After a short conversation, she wrote down a few points on her tablet, and then returned to their table. Meanwhile, the man struck up a conversation with the waiter, as if they were old friends. It was hard not to notice that Allison looked unusually quiet and slightly tense. Adding to my suspicions was the fact that her phone was on the table, which violated our strict house rule, no phones during meals. It was clear that something was wrong. Meanwhile, the girl approached other tables, struck up short conversations, 
quickly took notes, and soon left. The man remained impassive, talking to the waiter, but it was clear that he was not going to place an order. Meanwhile, my attention was focused on my wife, who seemed to be preoccupied with something. That young girl came up to our table and introduced herself to Judy. She explained that she is a college student studying psychology and ethics, and is currently conducting a survey for her graduate work. She politely asked if we would like to take part in it. After looking at her, I kindly declined, explaining that my wife and I were on a special holiday and preferred not to be disturbed. However, I suggested that if she provided her contact number, we could contact her later and take part in the survey. Her expression betrayed complete bewilderment. It became clear that she expected my consent and was not going to agree. My wife immediately intervened, urging me to help the girl. Jack, she clearly needs our help. I'm sure we can give her a minute. This behavior was unusual for my wife, because she did not like to get into such situations. I begged her if we could postpone the conversation, since we have important plans of our own. However, she persisted, insisting, please, let's hear her out. I took a deep breath before listening to her first question. Have you watched the movie Indecent Proposal? I replied in the negative, but my wife picked up. No, we haven't watched it, but we are familiar with the plot. I couldn't help but feel dislike for the girl. When I looked at the man accompanying her, he abruptly interrupted his conversation with the waiter and began to observe our table, which he had not done before in relation to others. Judy's gaze fell on me, waiting for an answer. However, I stubbornly avoided eye contact. She continued. Curious, she asked me what I thought of this proposal and its potential impact on the marriage. Almost without resisting, I replied, it seems to me that you don't care if I agree to be called that. However, if my wife approved of such an idea, it would inevitably lead to an immediate divorce. As I said these words, Allison raised an eyebrow, but Judy remained unperturbed. She asked again if you think you have the right to dictate to your wife what to do with her own body. I chuckled. By no means did I mean that if she accepted the offer, I would be in her way. However, while she is busy with her business elsewhere, I will be in our apartment, arranging the separation of our finances, packing up and starting the process of filing for divorce. Judy asked, Imagine that the offer would be, say, $2 million. Wouldn't that be enough to convince you to agree to this offer? She further asked if changing the contract would affect my decision in such a way that I would not receive any financial benefit if I divorced her. When I met her eyes for the first time, I replied, Judy, she knows me well. I get enough income to support myself. I have no desire to profit from the sale of my wife. Besides, even if she had agreed to the money, I would have refused it during the divorce. Dirty money does not bring happiness. Therefore, this proposal will not change my line of conduct. Excuse me, I need to go to the bathroom and cancel our order. You've ruined my mood and I don't have an appetite anymore. Alice, please be ready to leave when I get back. With a quick movement, I got up from my seat and headed towards the bathroom. However, when I got to the waiter's counter, I stopped. Could you cancel our table reservation? The people you let in are interfering with our rest, and I've lost my appetite for dinner here. The waiter looked at me in surprise and then said, This gentleman who is conducting the survey here will pay for your account. Feeling a sense of confusion, I decided to head to the toilet. A feeling of anxiety settled inside me, as if something bad was about to happen. Remembering my previous visit to this restaurant, I realized that I could sneak through the back entrance to the restroom so as not to attract attention. Standing there, I watched my wife enthusiastically typing a text message on her phone. Suddenly, the man's phone beeped, which made him pick up the phone and start typing. Shortly after he sent his message, my wife's phone started ringing, which made her reply, read the message, and reply to it. To my surprise, then the man's phone rang. As I continued to observe this unusual exchange, it became more and more obvious that they were having a hidden text conversation. I went back to our table and asked my wife who is this man at the next table. Allison surveyed her surroundings before replying, I don't know for sure but what's going on. 
it looks like there is some kind of problem. He unexpectedly paid the cost of our lunch. I think I recognized him, although I can't say for sure. It looks like you're texting him, I said, stumbling in mid-sentence, as if it were a matter of course. After she interrupted our meal, he tried to remain polite, she said. I said that I was in a bad mood right now and had no desire to have dinner. So I decided it was better for us to leave. But Allison became alarmed and suggested another option, saying she didn't like the idea of being impolite. She suggested that we stay in our seats. Then she got up and went to the bathroom. As she was leaving, I noticed her glance quickly at the man. After Judy came over to me, she sat down next to me, placing her hand on the table next to mine. In a serious tone, she asked, I have one more question. Amused, I grinned and carefully placed my hand on top of hers. Surprisingly, she made no attempt to remove her hand. Whether it's $20 million or $2 million, it doesn't change the essence of the matter, I replied. To tell the truth, no amount of money will help. As I spoke, I unconsciously began to squeeze her hand tighter. While her arms were slender, mine were more robust, which led to a rapid increase in discomfort. Grimacing, she begged, Please stop immediately. Unwilling to give up, I insisted, No, not until you reveal the information I want to get. Despite the easing of the pressure, I kept my grip. She warned me that she would scream if I didn't stop. I just grinned, daring to continue, confident that she would not do this for some hidden reasons that would make it uncomfortable for her to contact the authorities. I demanded to know the person's identity, and when she tried to take her hand away, I tightened my grip again. Suddenly the man came towards me and I instinctively shouted, Stop! One more step and the consequences will be deplorable. He stopped in place, and at that moment my wife appeared next to me, curiously watching what was happening. What's going on? What is it? She asked. I smiled and replied, Well, Allison, that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out. Judy... I suggest you give me an answer right now. Tears welled up in her eyes as she answered, Simon Armitage Jr. Releasing her hand, I sternly said, leave this place and never cross my path again. Glancing at Simon Armitage Jr., I immediately recognized his identity. Simon Armitage, the owner of the factory where Allison works, was undoubtedly the man's father. Although I had come across him several times, it was clear to me that he was nothing more than a despicable person who got the position of factory manager solely because of his family ties. He earned notoriety for his womanizing, and it was rumored that he was looking for married women to bolster his ego and present himself as an influential figure. Allison came over and sat down in a chair and spoke. Simon proposed. He promised us a staggering $2 million if I agreed to spend the coming weekend with him. I reluctantly agreed. With such a significant amount, we could become homeowners without the burden of a mortgage, create a fund for our children's college education, and even start planning a long-awaited addition to the family. We no longer have to rely on your promotion to move forward. Silently considering the offer, I finally plucked up the courage and asked, Did you agree? She replied in a soft but determined voice, Yes. When Simon Armitage Jr. settled down at the table, I remained motionless, avoiding eye contact. It was then that he uttered the words, I can fulfill any of your dreams, and the only price you will have to pay is 48 hours of your wife's time. The offer was simple. $2 million will be transferred to our joint account by Sunday evening, provided that she contacts you and confirms that you are at home. However, if you decide to leave, I will create an account exclusively for Allison, which will remain inaccessible to you. The decision is ultimately in your hands. I glanced at Allison, but directed my words at him. You can think of your $2 million somewhere far away from this place. If my wife has chosen the path of a corrupt woman, I don't need her presence or wealth. I've made my decision and I'm leaving. If she ends up in the car, there may still be a chance to save our marriage. But if she's not there, I'll pack my things and leave long before she gets back. So, Allison, it's time to make a decision. Allison stared at me with a determined expression on her face. Jack, 
I want to have a baby right now. Not wait another two years. If you can support us financially, this is our chance, and you're going to miss it. I chuckled, feeling that this alarmed her. There's no way we're going to have kids anytime soon. Your little prank has undermined my trust in you so much that even if we leave together now, it will take us years of therapy to restore it. If you decide to be with him, I will never touch you again. I got to my feet and accidentally brushed my napkin onto the plate of food in front of me. Having gathered my resolve, I turned to Allison, demanding that she make a decision. Without hesitation, I headed for the exit, watching as this fool tries to get up, but loses his balance. Quickly reaching out my hand, I lightly pressed it to his forehead and easily returned it to its place. Ignoring the commotion, I walked away, and the waiter cautiously approached me. I showed him not to approach me. When the door closed behind me, I heard Allison's shrill voice calling my name. With a cheerful look, I went to the car, easily opened the door, and got inside. Taking a break to calm down, I took a deep breath, letting the tension dissipate through my body, and only then started the engine. I drove slowly past the restaurant where Allison was staying, and the sight made me pick up speed and head straight home. Determined, I took my suitcase from the closet shelf and started packing. On autopilot, I quickly packed all my clothes and toiletries, packing them into several suitcases and black bags in just an hour. Just as I was finishing this job, my phone rang sharply. Allison was on the other end of the line, her voice filled with concern. How are you, baby? I deeply regret the way things turned out, but this offer is too tempting to refuse. I'm going to turn off the phone now and we'll meet on Sunday at about 7, she explained. I didn't say anything, just holding the phone to my ear. The silence seemed to make her uncomfortable, but I was devoid of any emotion, numb from all this. She is determined to make this decision, believing that it will benefit both of us. She said we could discuss it when she gets back on Sunday. She expressed a desire to have a child at the first opportunity, stressing that this would protect our lives. I asked her who would be the father of her child. The answer took her by surprise, but she answered, you, of course. Unwilling to accept this reality, I abruptly stopped the conversation. I gathered all my belongings as well as some other personal items and loaded them into the car. Then I went to the online banking and logged into my deposit account, withdrawing half of the funds. Then I went to the online divorce service website, where I filled out an application and deposited the required amount. As I was preparing to leave the house for the last time, a car suddenly pulled up, and to my surprise, Allison got out of it, screaming and begging me to stop. It turned out that this was nothing more than a practical joke, an ordinary April Fool's joke. The driver suddenly showed his true face, demonstrating a rather unpleasant attitude. After getting out of the car, they talked animatedly. It was just a prank. We assumed that you would eventually return to the restaurant. We've been waiting for you there for two whole hours. But then, Allison received your divorce letter, and we hurried back. At that moment, I looked at Allison, expressing my disappointment without words. If it was a joke, then it turned out to be such a terrible failure that it caused irreparable damage to our marriage. Now I urgently needed to get out of this situation, find peace elsewhere for a few days and think about my next actions. I got into the driver's seat and started the engine, but then I was startled by her shrill scream, begging me to withdraw the divorce papers. It was a Saturday afternoon and I found myself in the company of my brother and his wife, Becky, at their house. Becky recently spoke with Allison, and willingly shared with us the details of their conversation. Jack, she began, I don't believe it was a joke, but it certainly wasn't an attempt to woo another man. She is so desperate to have children that she is ready to do anything. However, deep down, she wasn't going to finish the job. Her intention was to encourage you to show that you have enough financial means to support her. Thus, she could object. If you have enough money, then why wait to have children? He's just her colleague. Believe me, he has absolutely no interest in having an intimate relationship with Allison. 
Moreover, he would probably prefer you. Now she understands that she herself created a situation where you lost trust in her, and believes that if you had a child, then love and trust would be restored. The question is, will you be able to do it? This question is quite complicated. Ever since Allison's closest friend got pregnant six months ago, she has been asking me persistently about our plans to have children. The dilemma is that by postponing this decision, I remain unsure about various issues, and I certainly don't want to raise a child in a dysfunctional family. Feeling depressed, I got up from the table and went to bed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, seeking solitude to reflect. By the time Sunday came, my mind remained clouded. The crux of my problem was these two hours. If this was really a plan, a joke, she would have returned home immediately. The fact that she refrained from doing so suggests that she had something important to discuss with Simon. I also found it hard to believe that Simon would actually prefer her to me. So I decided that I should file for divorce. Whatever the future holds for us, I will do it. It's been a month since the events unfolded. During this time, Allison turned to Simon for help in finding a lawyer, and as a result, the court ordered 12 consultations over four weeks three per week. As we sat in front of the counselor, a young woman whose gaze resembled that of my teacher in first grade, when I could barely read the entire alphabet, Allison and I entered into a subtle rivalry, discussing her plan and Simon's role in its creation. Interestingly, Judy actually turned out to be a psychology student, conducting research on how men react to stressful situations, and I became her prime example. After Allison's words, the consultant turned to me, and there was almost a hint of contempt in her words. Jack, you've already heard the whole story. Despite your wife's desire and need for your presence, why do you persist in seeking a divorce? At that moment, I couldn't help but believe that I was going to have similar conversations three times a week for the next four weeks. I looked into the consultant's eyes and expressed my doubt. Do you really hold that opinion? Because I personally find it hard to believe. There was a two-hour gap in her story, during which she could perform various actions, such as booking a room, intimacy, developing a plan, and returning home. I noticed Allison take a deep breath, and that prompted the counselor to sit up straight in her chair. Before she started talking, I interjected, I haven't finished talking yet. Remember we agreed not to interrupt the interlocutor, therefore I expect you to adhere to these rules. She never talked about those two hours, offered no explanation and provided no evidence. The true story of that evening lies in what happened during those two hours. However, you have focused solely on his preparation. The consultant was outraged. It's important for you to get through this so that you and your wife can rebuild your marriage. Getting to my feet, I said, Your duty is to determine if our marriage can be saved and not to force me to stay in a marriage that I want to leave. If she can't prove unequivocally that nothing happened in those two hours, I'm out of here. After the consultant denounced me, I was back in court just two days later. When I appeared before the judge, he looked at me with contempt, as if I were disgusting material that he had accidentally stepped on. Perplexed, he asked about my refusal to cooperate with the consultant. In response, I invited him to listen to the recording of our first session. In addition to the argument, I said that the consultant advised me not to pay attention to Allison's misconduct. Your Honor, I firmly believe that it is not the consultant's job to lecture me. My only goal is to find out the truth about that particular evening, and both my wife and the counselor seem to be hiding it. Cooperation works as a mutual exchange. If they refuse to answer my questions, I cannot fulfill their request to forgive my wife because I do not know about her actions. After a short pause, the judge asked me what information I wanted to get. Without hesitation, I answered simply, stating that there is a two-hour period in her chronology when no information is provided and she refuses to discuss it. I'm eager to find out what happened during that time. Unfortunately, my wife refuses to enter into a conversation on this topic, and the consultant believes that I do not need to know this. 
I am currently here because the consultant wants you to advise me to stop asking this question, as she considers my question unnecessary. The judge, with his chin, which he often rubbed thoughtfully, resembling a movie star of old movies, spoke, You deserve to be informed. Please sit down. Pointing to the consultant, he added, I asked the consultant to be present as a witness. During the hearing, my wife's lawyer, accompanied by a consultant, got up to address the court. Your Honor, he began, the consultant is not involved in this particular case. She has her responsibilities, and she just wants Mr. Samuels to stop his obstructive behavior. Bringing her as a witness will not help resolve this case. The judge, clearly outraged by this statement, replied, It should be noted that it was your client and her consultant who initiated this lawsuit, accusing Mr. Samuels of unwillingness to cooperate. I see that Mrs. Samuels is not willing to cooperate, and the consultant is providing her with cover. The choice is obvious. Either she testifies, or I stop the consultation and give a divorce. The choice is yours. The lawyer and the consultant began to argue heatedly, but in the end the consultant reluctantly got up from her seat and headed for the podium. With a solemn expression on her face she swore to tell the truth, and the judge asked, are you aware of what has been happening in the last two hours? There was a moment of silence in the room as the consultant considered her answer, and the judge sternly reminded her, Madam, remember that you are bound by your oath and must give an answer to this question. She replied in a low, barely audible tone, Yes, I'm aware. However, when she fell silent, he turned to her with a convincing request. Please enlighten the court by telling about what happened and this time speak directly. Mrs. Samuels and Mr. Armitage went to a nearby bar to discuss recent events and develop a plan of action in case of their consequences. Mrs. Samuels was firmly convinced that Mr. Armitage's proposal was the fastest way to a large family, which she had always dreamed of. She expected Mr. Samuels to come back and look for her, but when he unexpectedly sent her the divorce papers, she panicked. She now realizes that the offer made to verify Mr. Samuel's consent was a mistake. She wants to get over this situation and start all over again. My main task as a consultant appointed by Mrs. Samuels is to make sure that Mr. Samuels understands that the offer was just an offer, and if he rejects it, she will completely abandon the idea. The judge chuckled and remarked, Do you understand the seriousness of your words? Your role is not to force Mr. Samuel to fulfill Mrs. Samuel's wishes. You were appointed by the court to explore the possibility of saving their marriage. But the counselor intervened, saying, If he can recognize and overcome the rejection of the proposal, then the marriage will have a chance to be saved. The judge looked over his glasses and said sternly, Consultant, I am terminating the hearing because it seems to me that you lack impartiality. Then he turned his attention to me, addressing me as Mr. Samuel, and asked, What are your wishes for this hearing? My lawyer glanced at me briefly, then stood up and said, My client wants to get a divorce. Allison's lawyer reacted very sharply to this, practically jumping up from his chair. Your Honor, Honor, he interjected, You cannot abruptly terminate the hearing on such grounds. It should go the way my client wants to express his position on this marriage. The judge looked at him intently and said, If you had played by the rules, I would have followed your advice. However, you turned the consultation into a farce by trying to hide vital information from Mr. Samuel. I strongly disapprove of such behavior. I approve of the divorce. An hour later when I got home, I saw Allison sitting on the doorstep, her face bathed in tears. Why, Jack? All I wanted was to have a big family. Gently taking her hand, I led her into the house. You lied to me, manipulated me, and treated me like a fool. Deep down, you knew that the offer you made was unacceptable, but you tried to fulfill it anyway. I will never be able to be with a woman who would do this to me. Without stopping crying, she begged, But I really want us to be together. I want to have four children with you so that we will never lack for anything. I couldn't believe what I had just heard. I shook my head in disbelief. Okay, go ahead, 
Take your $2 million and look for someone who will give birth to your children, I replied bitterly. What about me? I will never be able to be with a person who considers such behavior acceptable. Goodbye, Allison. With these words, I turned around and boldly stepped into a new chapter of my life. Only time will tell if everything will be better now.